that disruptive ideas can change the world. And more importantly, I believe that disruptive ideas can change the world for the better. I'd like to tell you a little bit about my, st my story and myself and how I've been using disruptive ideas in my work and hopefully to a certain degree changing the lives of the people around us. I'm originally from Belgrade, Serbia. Those of you who may not know, Serbia is this wonderful country in Eastern Europe, a little bit far away from where we are here in San Diego. And throughout my life, I've been moving back and forth between Serbia and the United States. So they're two very different countries, very different contexts, cultures. And part of that has certainly been because there was a war going on in my home in the former Yugoslavia. But more importantly, the reason why I made all these moves between these two continents was because my parents wanted for my sister and for myself to grow up with a very globalized education and an understanding of the world around us. And that's really shaped the way that I live my life. And so when I talk about disruptive ideas, I want you to think, well, what is really a disruptive idea? So I'll give you a really simple example. Think about the invention of the wheel. The wheel was invented thousands of years ago, and yet it's revolutionized the way we live our lives. It's revolutionized transportation. It's revolutionized so many things. And for as many years as we've had the wheel, we've also had people traveling. And yet for the longest time, this is how people traveled. With luggage in one hand, briefcase in the other, in the case of my grandfather. And it wasn't until the 1970s that somebody came up with the idea of, ah, let's put a wheel on a suitcase. And voila! I'm sure some of you have had this situation where um, you're trying to carry around all of, your, all of your luggage at the same time. And so certainly this notion of attaching a wheel to a suitcase has had wonderful, um, wonderful implications in your life. But unfortunately, um, when these luggages first came out, they were actually quite expensive. So uh, my parents didn't have that much money. And so we came up with our own invention uh, of physically attaching wheels to luggages. And in fact, and further iteration of this, of this innovation uh, happened quite recently. A week ago, my sister was in Shanghai visiting her friend Lauren. And on their way back to the airport, my sister lives in Spain, Lauren came up with this great way of transporting luggage. You take a wheel, you attach it to a luggage. And it's really um, this, this idea of what is all the iterations that we can come up with in terms of innovation that takes a small disruptive idea like the invention of the wheel to something like this. So like I said, I've been moving back and forth between these two countries. And when I talk about disruptive ideas, the one that's really changed my life has been technology. I've been living and moving back and forth between these two continents. And when you're an eight-year-old and you're writing letters to your parents and saying, mom and dad, I really miss you. A girl was really mean to me in school today. Or you're 12, and you're running to your friend, and you're saying, Elizabeth, I met a boy. When you send a letter, and it goes by snail mail, it takes three months to get to the other person. And by the time those childhood angst pour their, themselves out onto a piece of paper and then travel all the way to the other side of the world, that moment is gone, and it's been lost forever. And so it's incredible to me to think about how much technology has played a role in my life and how much has brought my family closer together. And even to this day, you know, I live in Colombia, I live in South America, very far away from my family. And so this back and forth communication has really been facilitated by, by technology. And I'm proud to say that my grandfather, who once carried his luggage in his hand, is now using Skype to communicate with his daughter, with his granddaughters. <laughs> So it's incredible, you know, um, what we've what we've come to in terms of technology and what it's allowed us to do just in my lifetime. And I'm quite young, and I'm really excited about thinking about what technology can do for us in the future as we move forward in life. And I think that sometimes we demonize technology. And in fact, I've seen couples sitting at a dinner table in a restaurant, and they're just sitting there on their phones, and they're not communicating with each other. Well, they are communicating perhaps with each other via chat. But in a certain sense, I think we've seen more, mo many of these articles talking about the negative effects of technology. But I'd really like to focus on the positive, because I think that there's a wonderful opportunity for technology, Excellent. and particularly technology in the developing world, if you want to call it that. So I'd like, to I'd like for you to think about the fact that one out of every six people in this world 
lives on an average of $1.25 per day or less. That's the cost of a cup of coffee, a really cheap cup of coffee, but $1.25 a day, I'd like for you to imagine what that really means. And let's not talk about $1.25 per day, let's talk about an average of $1.25 per day. That's extreme poverty defined by certain, uh, certain organizations. So maybe one day you'll earn $1.25, the next day you'll earn $5, and then for the next three days, you'll earn nothing. Budgeting your money and managing those scarce resources is one of the most crucial elements of the life of a person living in poverty today. And don't think about poverty being something that's focused just on um, the third world, if you'd like to call it, countries like Colombia, countries like Serbia, where I come from. Poverty happens in America every single day. So for the past two years, I've been working with this organization called Fundación Capital. And Fundación Capital is a wonderful organization because what we do is we look at the issues of poverty through the lens of innovation, through the lens of scale. And what we've seen is that poverty, as we've been approaching it for the past 10, 20, 30 years, our approach hasn't really changed that much. And we haven't even made a small dent in what it means to be poor. And we have seen some small improvements in terms of statistics, but we're so far from where we really need to be. And so when we think about poverty, we do it through the lens of the formal financial system, through something called financial inclusion. And so that means that when you look at these, the financial behavior of the poor, and you look at the way in which they're spending their money, and you try to provide them with services, whether it's savings, access to a savings account, to keep their assets uh, in a safe place, whether it's access to microinsurance that can help them weather emergencies, which is where a lot of their money goes, unfortunately, or whether it's through safe access to loans, preventing over indebtedness and making sure that they really have the resources at hand that they need. So we work with governments, and by working with governments, we're able to reach scale. We work with financial institutions to make sure that the, the right tools are out there. And then we bring in that extra element, and that's innovation. So I run this initiative called Lista, and what we're doing with Lista is we're trying to find technology-based solutions to scaling up financial inclusion initiatives and improving the financial capabilities of the poor. So how are we doing that? We're doing it with tablet computers. This was something that you could probably agree is a slightly disruptive idea, and I'll tell you why. For many years now, people have been giving financial education through workshops, through talks, where participants will come and they'll, you know, perhaps incur some fees, transportation costs, time costs, and they'll come, they'll listen, they'll learn, hopefully they'll remember some of what they learned, but they won't really interact with the system. They won't receive a very personalized experience. They won't really be able to take that information home with them and share it with their families. So we came up with a slightly wacky idea. We said, could we replace the in-person workshop with a tablet computer? So people thought we were crazy. Uh, they certainly did. Uh, we came across a lot of negative feedback at the beginning, but we really decided that it was worth the risk to come up with something that could revolutionize our approach to poverty alleviation. So we gave it a shot. We designed this really cool app that's very easy to use. And so somebody who doesn't even know how to check their SMS, their text messages on a very basic standard phone can use a tablet computer. And these are women, particularly, who have never even used a computer. And so now they're using tablets. And we've come up with a really interesting methodology. We identify community leaders. A community leader is given a tablet. And she acts sort of as a temporary librarian for about a month, providing access to the tablet to different people within her community. And that's the way in which you can share access to the tablet. So a really interesting thing happens. And just to, to uh, let you guys know, we've had really just fantastic results with this, uh, with this experience, with the tablet computers. And in fact, we'll be scaling it up uh, in Colombia and Brazil and a few other countries very quickly to reach thousands and thousands of more users. But I'd really like to share with you one particular story that hit home with me. And that's the story of Maria Brigitte and her daughter, Joana. Maria Brigitte is from a rural community called Combita in Colombia. And Maria Brigitte did have the opportunity to go to school, or at least she thought she had the opportunity to go to school. Her parents sent her to live with a friend in a small town close by so that she could go to school and that she could learn. 
And instead of going to school and learning, unfortunately, she was asked to stay home and to help out in the house and to work in the house. So rather than going to school, learning how to read, she was working at home, somebody else's home. Of course, when her parents found out what had happened to her, they immediately brought her back home. They tried to enroll her in school, but at that point it was too late. She had lost the confidence. She had lost the opportunity. She didn't feel comfortable going back to school, and so she never learned how to read. And when she was at home with this tablet computer, of course, it sparked a lot of interest. I mean, you should see this woman's home. There's so much family love, but there's just so little physical things in there. And so bringing in a high technology item like a tablet computer really shifted the family dynamics and it caused so much interest. And so her daughter sat down and she asked, mom, what is that? And her mom said, oh, you know, it's this, this tablet. I'm trying to figure out how it works. Maybe you can help me out. So they sat down and her daughter, Joanna, realized that her mother didn't know how to read. So Joanna sat down and over the course of just 20 days, rather than helping her mother learn financial education and rather than her mother being the one teaching her daughter how to read, it was the daughter that taught her mother how to read. That's innovation. That to me is the definition of a disruptive idea. You come up with something, it's a small change, you're really trying to make a difference in somebody's life and yet here they are taking your wonderful idea and bringing it to a whole new scale. And it's incredible to me that just by having this opportunity to start and to play around with these small ideas that you can really make a significant difference in somebody's life. I have to admit, I'm not a risk taker. <laughs> you may say, well, you're living in Colombia, you know, you're moving between all these, these parts of the world and, and you've had all these experiences. How is it possible that you don't like risk? Well, I come from a country that's been through a lot of issues. Um, <laughs> War was certainly not something that was on my agenda. Uh, and I think life has its sort of unpredictable ways of moving the path around. And so even though I'm not a risk taker, I was encouraged to take risks through my work and I was encouraged to fail and to fail often, fail quickly, learn from my mistakes and move on. And so that's exactly what I've been doing for the past few years. And it's really changed my perspective on life. It's improved my work as a professional and I think it's helped me become a better person. And so I'd really like to encourage all of you out there to take some risks in your life. Consider ways in which you can come up with your own disruptive ideas. Hopefully, your disruptive ideas will change the work that you do, will improve the lives of people within your community, and hopefully will have some impact on a global scale. Thank you.